Um, I want to thank Angus and David for having me. Um, uh, unlike the other pr presentations, this is about something that is very much in the works and really in the planning. Our UCL group, uh, Laura Bear, David Tuckett, Tim Baisley, and I seek to understand how information on Brexit will emerge and how it can be interpreted. I'm sorry I have to use that term. Um, insofar as quantitative data on, on the impact of the UK's withdrawal from the EU may be belated or unavailable, we posit that the bank's agent network can provide acute narratives. The report on the unfolding consequences of Brexit in real time. Narratives that are fully contextualized in particular sectors of the economy and re regions of the UK. Unsurprisingly, we think, as do senior personnel of the bank, that meaningful information relevant to, to the work of policymakers can be gleaned from the network of 9,000 contacts strategically positioned across the UK. We seek to examine how these micro-level narratives can inform what Ricardo Rees is so here and uh, Alan Blinder term the macroeconomics, the acro macroeconomic allegories of monetary policy. David, uh, Laura, David, and I have been shadowing the agents over the last three months and listening to the interviews they conduct with their contacts in retail, finance, agriculture, real estate, um, as well as various service industries. Our claim is that precisely at a time when fundamental understanding about, uh, understandings about the UK economy may be subject to significant shifts and or transformations. The agents are providing reports encompassing the micro foundations of a macroeconomics, of a narrative economics, excuse me. Further, we seek to investigate how these narratives move through the bank, influencing policy pronouncements and underwriting communications with various segments of the, uh, the various segments of, uh, excuse me, with market participants and various segments in the strata of the public. In this presentation, I'm going to delineate the basic features of a narr narrative economics, as well as identifying the protagonists who enliven it. This is a very preliminary statement drawn from my current discussions within our research team, as well as my own work as an anthropologist in and around central banks over the last 17 years. It is at the moment an illustrative account with rough edges, very many rough edges, and perhaps extravagant claims. We're in the process of refining the expo this exploratory approach with focused research questions and testable hypotheses. And again, again, we're trying to blend our approaches and we're just at the first stages of that at the moment. I think it's fair to say that our conceptualization of a narrative economics premised on the view that, at least my view, that markets are a function of language is more expansive than that proposed by George Akloff, <coughs> Robert Schiller, and others. That said, I don't think our approach is, uh, I don't think our approach is fully or necessarily incompatible with theirs. So, what is an anthropologist doing in the central bank? Um, uh, in the summer of 2013, Julian Tett wrote, wrote a column that focused on my work. And this is the cartoon by Ingram Penn that accompanied, that accompanied the piece in the Financial Times. And um, yes, uh, I'm, I think, the person on the right. <laughs> and I don't wear that kind of hat. <laughs> uh, but what interests me about this is that uh, my presence seems to incite shamanistic practices of <laughs> by the central bankers. Anyway, um, one of the people was asking about, uh, the last session was asking about journalists and how they um, uh, frame narratives. And I think Julian Ted is very preoccupied with exactly that. Um, a few months later, it's a few months after this was published, I was at a dinner um, at, at Jillian's home in Manhattan and seated next to a former central banker. We chatted about various subjects uh, without touching on central banks or central banking until close to the end of the evening when he asked, well, he asked me 
what is an anthropologist doing in a central bank? I replied something like this, and this is, this is something like what I said. It is not what I said. Um, I've examined how central bankers seek to endow the future with discernible features that we, the public, can reflect and act upon, animating or curtailing our propensities to produce, consume, borrow, and lend. I argue that central bankers, rather than predicting the future, seek to create elements of a tractable future. They do this with words. They use language to explore, promulgate, and sustain the ideas that animate, animate our economic future, as well as the structures of feeling, the sentiments, expectations, and desires that make them real. The future in the first in the future in the in the first instance, the future is in the first instance a technical problem for central bankers, the intertemporal problem upon which the basic challenges of monetary affairs hinges. By what means is the value of money to be anchored over time? My dinner companion responded that that was exactly what he did, but he wouldn't put it in those terms. He further recognized that what I was doing was recasting the conventions of monetary policy from the perspective of the public, foregrounding the rhetorical imperatives underwriting contemporary monetary, monetary affairs. And, and indeed, this is the central premise, or was the central premise of my work. So how did I come by this formulation? Um, I was in New Zealand in the 1990s when I first became interested in monetary affairs. At that time, I learned about experiments pr pursued by personnel at the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, glossed prosaically as inflation targeting. And I detected something familiar, the operation of what linguists and anthropologists term performativity, albeit unusual variant of performativity. I understood that inflation targeting, although shrewdly designed within macroeconomic and monet uh, uh, monetary theory, also exceeded those frameworks. In my early discussions at the Reserve Bank, I broached ideas about rhetoric, narrative, and communication that seemed relevant to the design and operation of this new monetary regime. And, 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 and they were quick to respond that this is basically what they were trying to do. Uh, in 2001, um, and this is, by the way, a kind of longer statement of what my project has been about in the past. Um, and you'll also notice that although the title of my book is A Economy of Words, uh, I've had real trouble putting this in <laughs> concise form. Okay. Forgive me. Um, uh, but this kind of links it into some history, uh, to history into to some theory. So in 2001, I extended the research to four other central banks. In addition to the Reserve Bank, uh, I began to spread, spend time at the Ricks Bank, <laughs> the Bundesbank, the European Central Bank, and the Bank of England. And with the onset of the financial crisis, I examined how the conventions of inflation targeting were refined and adapted via quantitative easing and forward guidance to address the contingencies of the crisis. And most importantly, I suppose, with each stage of the crisis, communication seemed to become more and more important, and I tried my best to um, track that. By the time I arrived at the Ricks Bank in early 2009, my appearance was no longer greeted with, what are you doing here, uh, but rather with, what took you so long to get here? I'm being slightly facetious, but I have a story that can kind of illustrate that. Uh, in each of these central banks, I sought to align my research with the questions they, the personnel of these institutions, were asking. Fundamental my, to my approach was the view that these figures, central bankers, were engaged in a deep anthropology of money and credit. Uh, in that spirit, let me turn to a brief aside by another <coughs> former central banker, Ben Bernanke. This statement, uh, excuse me, uh, so here's the statement. When I was at the Federal Reserve, I occasionally observed that monetary policy is 98% talk and only 2% action. The ability to shape market expectations of future policy through public statements is one of the most powerful tools the Fed has. The downside for policymakers, of course, is that the cost of sending the wrong message can be high. Presumably, presumably that is why my predecessor, Alan Greenspan, told the Senate Committee 
that as a central banker he had learned to mumble with great incoherence. <laughs> in the informal genre of a blog post, indeed his first blog post, the former chair of the Federal Reserve System broached, albeit wryly, the deepest questions about the nature of contemporary monetary affairs. He asserted that monetary policy is managed not solely or necessarily by conventional levers that central bankers employ to set interest rates and regulate the availability of money and credit, but by talk. Uh, this assertion, of course, begs a series of other questions. What is the nature of this talk? Where does it come from? How does it work? Further still, it opens vertiginous questions of how markets, particularly financial markets, operate as a function of language. Talk is action, but who is listening? Burnett is suggesting that there is an audience for this talk, an audience that is not merely overhearing policy pronouncements, but enacting them prospectively. This talk is not simply a descriptive genre for the representation of economic and financial conditions. It is the substance of policy. By drawing attention to the now famous aside by his predecessor, Bernanke contrasts his attitude towards communication with the traditional stance of central bankers, as resolutely secretive as figures who cultivate opacity and view talk, clear, unambiguous talk, as antithetical to the exercise of their statutory duties. And I believe a senior official of the Bank of England described the bank's form of policy as keeping the bank out of the press and the press out of the <coughs> bank, <laughs> which I think captures the... Bernanke's modest blog post also disrupts fundamental assumptions of economics, not least of which how economic ideas are created and by whom, as well as how these art ideas are integral to the operation of the economy and not sequestered from it in the realm of academic scrutiny. Talk implies a conversation, and thus from the standpoint of neoclassic economics, it represents an anomaly insofar as it spawns forms of social relations as instruments for gleaning information and for the exercise of policy. This talk has an unusual reach demarcating a conversation by vast global networks of interlocutors in which distinctive forms of knowledge are circulated relentlessly. Talk also reaches down to the deepest levels of quantitative research within central banks, to the technical operation of the large macroeconomic models, and crucially to the scenarios they generate. Variables are critically, critically excuse me, variables are critically scrutinized, theory continually reassessed, and layer upon layer of contextual information added discursively. The economy and the financial system undergo a continuous and relentless linguistic intermediation. For us, perhaps most important for our research, language is used experimentally to explain and articulate novel contingencies defining central banks' relationship to the market and to the public. And this is certainly true as we face the possibility of Brexit. Far more than the price of money is at stake in central bankers' narratives. Talk is their two-way dialogic bridge to the sociological and the political, and to the, entre entre and to the entrepreneurial relationships within which creative economic action is planned and orchestrated. Thus coextensive, thus coextensive with the market is an expansive communicative field across which words and ideas circulate, and within which policy pronouncements, thereby informed, are reflected and acted upon. Uh, let me return to the Bank of England's agents network and its remarkable capacity to frame and to answer the kinds of, ex to answer just this kind, these kinds of uh, questions that I posed. Central bankers employ carefully constructed networks, both formal and informal networks, as a means to glean backstories, incorporating alternate epistemic framework that is an alternative to their standard quantitative analyses, to render the economy and the financial system legible. In this way, they draw on stories continually generated outside the central bank from situated actors who are themselves orchestrating and evaluating economic and financial conditions. The Bank of England's network, network operates by means of a relatively small staff of agents spread across 
12 regional offices. The network is composed, again, of approximately 9,000 contacts in the business and financial communities, as well as in government and non-governmental agencies. And the regional agents interview six or 700 of these contacts each month. The contact pool is selected with a cross section of the companies in terms with a cross section of companies in terms of sector, location, and size in order to get a reasonably balanced view of the UK economy as a whole. And excuse me, that's a quote from to Economist Superbank. Um, there is an amplification effect that ramifies across this community of the field. Each of the 9,000 contacts, the moving parts of the network, are continually in conversation with scores of other contacts, creating an enormous epistemic apparatus of secondary and tertiary actors that extend the field of intelligence gathering far beyond the shores of the UK, yielding a system for gleaning information with a global reach. The reports generated are summarized by a London-based coordinator and presented to the nine-member Monetary Policy and Financial Stability Committees of the bank just prior to deliberations on interest rates. Senior policymakers from the bank, including the governor and deputy governor, as well as other members of the MPC, occasionally accompany the agents on these forays into the field. These senior officials communicate central bank policy during these visits, but they also actively solicit stories, anecdotal data, from the employees, managers, and owners of these enterprises. They talk numbers, they talk trends, they talk outlooks. <coughs> In these interchanges, they glean, they glean contemporaneous reports on the UK economy, and they also garner from the, their interlocutors the details and contradictions typically lost or suppressed in economic statistics. Above all, they put words both to the ephemera of local expectations and to the changing competitive pressures unfolding in global markets, particularly among the UK, UK's trading partners. The network of interlocutors provides technical representations of the British economy, imparting or restoring social mediation and social context to economic analysis. The diverse group of contexts that make up the network perform descriptive, explanatory, and interpretive labor, refining the discursive nature of economic phenomena in real time. In these face-to-face -face conver conversations, officials draw on the creative insights of individuals who are making, remaking, and unmaking the economic drama prospectively under conditions where Kedros Paribus does not obtain. These interlocutors are, in fact, protagonists who model the economy and the financial system on their own terms and for their own purposes. Their ideas, their configurations of belief, thereby play a decisive role in the economic and monetary drama by which investment, employment, and consumption plans by firms, households, and individuals become the basis of action or inaction. The forward-looking appraisal of these contacts, articulated in a language that may or may not be congruent with conventional economic theory, are capable on their own of orchestrating the transformations by which plans become deeds. Information, data, and intelligence managed by means of the network provide policymakers with distinctive insights, thick descriptions on the op operation of the UK economy. This is sort of a summary <laughs> statement I, I, uh, I made to cover some of this material. Um, central bankers create and enter, as it were, a communicative field upon which countless protagonists model the economy, model economic phenomena for their own purposes, employing their own pragmatic insights and grounded truths. They and we are confronted with actors whose future are enlivened by just about every emotional sensibility, every constellation of thought and belief, reason and unreason, rationality and irrationality, as well as every human proclivity to create truth, untruth, virtue, beauty, and depravity. The stories told by these unruly figures can impel or impede the leaps of faith that ratify or foreclose a tractable future. 
the efficacy of monetary policy thus rests on the representational enterprise of these protagonists with whom central bankers must orchestrate prospectively the contingencies of economic stability and growth. Thus, central bankers are not alone in their modeling endeavors. They must continually confront and at times defer to the theoretical machinations of these protagonists. Uh, okay. um, so, let me see. As I said at the outset, we're trying to work out a method for this project. We're trying to see what kind of misinformation we can glean from these contacts from the network that the banks uh, <coughs> manage. Um, some of this information uh, gets delivered to the policy committee of the Bank of England uh, just prior to, and particularly the Monetary Policy Committee, just prior to interest rate decisions. It's a small part of a much larger set of uh, analyses that um, are used for deliberations on, on interest rates. Um, but one of the things that caught my attention is that this system can work in reverse, um, that there are puzzles in the data that people on the NPC recognize, um, and they can use the, take these puzzles, talk to the, uh, to the agents, and ask them to inquire about what's happening in the field. That is to say, anomalies about productivity, in particular or recent about productivity, can be answered by sending the agents out and allowing the agents to ask questions and to show how fundamental economic concepts are evolving over time. So what I'm describing here is the micro foundations of narrative economics is about this flux, this dynamic change that happens in the economy. And it's happening with, I guess, well, happening all the time in the economy. In moments like this becomes increasingly important to acknowledge and the agents provide access to how concepts are being rethought, reconceptualized. Um, so that's how I, you know, the rest of this paper is about that. There's also another part to this uh, notion of a narrative economics that is linking it to political economy. And um, it gets back to the, to the issues that were first uh, developed in my book. Um, and it is to think of how markets are created and how creative creation of markets depends on documents, on law, and it is fundamentally a problem of language. Um, it first occurred to me when I was looking at the uh, accession treaty, the Chinese accession treaty, um, uh, to the WTO, and I looked through these hundreds of pages of documents, and I realized what was being created was a market, what was created a set of market relationships, whereby 1.2 billion people would be incorporated in the global economy. Um, so part of what we're going to do, I hope, is to uh, develop these institutional questions and um, also draw in into our project um, regulators and, uh, and draw in their expertise as part of the project. So I'll stop there. <laughs>